Hi everyone, um, it's great to be in such a uh, wonderful community. So, um, my name is Vincentas Grinos, I'm a co-founder and CEO at IPXO. And uh, IPXO essentially uh, is focused on building the management tools for IP addresses. Uh, also, uh, with the options of uh, monetizing and leasing them. And uh, essentially, um, what uh, today I'm going to present uh, is uh, the overview uh, about IPv4 ecosystem, uh, but at the same time touching uh, uh, bits and pieces around the IPv6. Uh, so, um, IPXO, uh, we um, um, have a philosophy building up our uh, platform on three pillars, uh, basically on ecosystem, management, and network. And, uh, you know, unifying the internet uh, governance policies, uh, also connecting uh, the networks um, together, uh, and actually giving the tools for uh, the IP holders, uh, that actually helps a lot uh, to kind of uh, see uh, the whole thing, what is happening around uh, the IPv4 and at the same time IPv6 ecosystems. So uh, IPXO connects uh, around uh, 350 uh, ISNs uh, with over 3 million IP addresses. And uh, we have uh, uh, estimated that uh, around uh, 40 million uh, IP addresses potentially uh, IPXO can access within the IP holders that are already on the platform. And so our goal is to create the environment where every single business, no matter how big or small it is, uh, would be uh, able to have the equal rights uh, to access uh, the IP addresses and uh, the resources itself. Uh, but uh, today the um, overview, I'm going to focus on IPv4, but at the same time, it's a disclaimer, we are very big fans of IPv6. <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, addressing the IPv4 uh, issues, uh, we also are building the tools to address the IPv6 management uh, as well. So, um, let's review uh, the actual sustainability of IPv4, how sustainable it is. And, uh, you know, uh, talking, uh, talking about the uh, BGP, uh, we actually uh, got a snapshot uh, in February to see uh, what we have uh, up in BGP table. And what we actually saw that uh, the biggest unannounced space uh, is uh, uh, at Amazon. While, for example, the biggest chunk of uh, advertised IP space uh, belongs to the Department of Defense. So, uh, but at the same time, if we look at the largest uh, buyers versus sellers, we see that uh, the uh, top three uh, biggest sellers are Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And Amazon alone uh, holds 44% uh, of IP acquisition market. While uh, combining three of them, uh, we get around 70% of all uh, IP acquisition market owned by those three companies. And what we uh, can see from the seller standpoint is that um, uh, the legacy space uh, holders are the biggest sellers. And, uh, well, uh, that's actually uh, an interesting information because uh, last uh, year it was around 40 million uh, IP addresses uh, transferred. Now, uh, you know, having all those numbers um, in mind, 
if we would look at the total pool of IPv4 addresses, so we actually have uh, uh, 1.3 uh, billion of IP addresses that are uh, unadvertised. However, from the previous slides, we can see that those numbers are inaccurate. And, uh, you know, having in mind the case for DOD, we can see that, uh, you know, you can't say that there is a 1.3 billion of IP addresses that are available, right? It's probably more than that. Um, so, are we really short on the IP addresses, IPv4 addresses? It's, uh, you decide. <laughs> but at the same time, um, you know, uh, what are the alternatives for, uh, for the actual community? What alternatives do we have? Are we going to, like, uh, you know, work on IP acquisition and uh, um, not find the ways uh, how we can actually make uh, the, you know, community to, to be kind of friendly to each other, let's put it this way. So, uh, you know, our aim uh, at IPXO is to actually ad address those things. And uh, let me give you the overview of, um, you know, what happened with the infrastructure um, uh, industry uh, from early 90s to what we have today. So, you know, uh, back in 2000s, many of the businesses thought that, uh, you know, we have to have uh, their own servers, we, uh, we have to have their own racks, they have to have their own uh, CS admins to actually look after uh, all the infrastructure. But everything's changed when, in 2006, AWS came and um, they said, hey guys, you know, we built uh, an awesome cloud solution for you with uh, hundreds of features uh, where your apps can actually, you know, scale up automatically, load balancers, etc., etc." et And, uh, you know, three things that actually got into their mind is trust, because Amazon was a trusted company. Uh, then, of course, emotion, because, well, Amazon, uh, they were using that uh, cloud uh, themselves. And, of course, logic, because, well, you kind of, you know, save on a lot of moving parts for your business, and rather than to kind of, you know, uh, focus on the infrastructure, you focus on your core businesses, right? So it was a no-brainer for many businesses to actually choose AWS. And later in 2008, when uh, Google and uh, Microsoft uh, introduced uh, their cloud solutions, also uh, diversified over those three players, right? <laughs> so um, that's also a thing about IP leasing. Uh, and uh, this is an alternative that we actually been uh, working on. And of course, um, you know, many, um, many guys uh, thought that IP leasing, you know, is uh, some sort of a gray area industry and stuff like that. But, you know, having in mind um, that you have risks and benefits you can always start from addressing the risks and how to actually eliminate them. So my question to you, how many of you guys uh, leased IP addresses from someone? Can you raise the hands? There you go. And how many of you guys have monetized IP addresses to someone? There you go. So I'm sure you're very well aware about uh, what I'm talking about, what alternatives I, uh, I present here. So, and of course, there are risks. Uh, there are risks, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, the, the most important uh, thing uh, to kind of address is, of course, abuse observability. And uh, many uh, kind of uh, are missing uh, that critical piece around KYC. Um, it's always good to understand um, with who you have a business, right? And uh, it's always important to 
understand uh, what type of footprint that company had from the abuse perspectives previously uh, so that you could uh, even avoid um, any abuse cases uh, in the future. And so um, having that in mind, um, we also um, thought that, uh, okay, let's compare the IP acquisition with the um, IP leasing rates. And actually, we uh, sliced the uh, kind of uh, pandemic period to see, uh, because it was a very good moment to see how the companies were moving to their digital transformation. So um, you can see in, in those slides how we actually um, compare the IP acquisition rates versus IP leasing rates. And we can see a clear, um, a clear uh, spikes in both, um, in both charts. Uh, However, um, IP acquisition prices went up by like 100%, while um, IP, um, IP leasing rates uh, were slightly lower. But at the same time, it also depends uh, from the IP acquisition prices, right? And um, then, of course, it, uh, it went down because many of the uh, enterprises uh, uh, absorbed uh, a huge amounts of IP addresses where later, you know, where uh, we don't need it. Uh, but then again, actually, I wanted to compare the S&P 500 index to see how, for example, uh, during the pandemics, we had uh, this cor correlation. And uh, actually, we, we, I, I would say that we have a correlation between data, uh, between the IP acquisition prices and uh, between the S&P 500 indexes, because many businesses, many online businesses actually uh, were living very happily during pandemics because of all that digital transformation that was happening. And uh, um, the case the case here is, and uh, the question to you guys, uh, you know, how can we impact as a community uh, the whole IPv4 uh, ecosystem? And, um, you know, looking from the networks operators, because we talk a lot with uh, many telcos, infrastructure providers, and, uh, you know, surprisingly, um, we see that many of the... Um, infrastructure providers um, do not pay attention in the management efforts of their IP addresses. And actually, we had an interesting conversation, one of the um, large enterprise where actually they approached us and they said, hey guys, you know, we have 2 million IP addresses, but we have no clue where they are. So it was an interesting conversation, but um, we, we definitely get such cases. And uh, also RPKI, uh, you know, we still see that uh, many of the, um, you know, end users uh, in our platform still use that classic LOA thing, you know. Um, nobody is even asking about LOA objects and stuff like that. LOA is like a classic thing. So um, we see that still a lot of networks uh, do not um, support RPKI or, like, you know, does not want to. Uh, who is accuracy? So that's a, a big one. And, uh, you know, uh, who is accuracy sometimes contradicts with the um, business priorities versus uh, registrar policies. And um, addressing that thing uh, helps all of the... Uh, like players in the community, you know, starting from the law enforcement and ending up, you know, to, to the actual end users um, where, you know, incidents can be traced out uh, much faster. Then, of course, IPv6 adoption. So um, many of uh, SMBs even don't think about IPv6, and that's a sad story, but it's true, you know. And um, uh, even... You know, during the pandemic times, 
nobody is even um, bothered about IPv6, and we haven't noticed any large movements about IPv6 adoption. Now, if we will um, see the perspectives from the registry's uh, perspective, so we actually see that there are still um, a lot of things um, to, to be done uh, in terms of the policies, uh, but also from the technological approach. So what I mean by that is that um, in some of the registrars, um, you require the justification uh, for the IP addresses that, for example, you acquire. So if you are a business and you're willing to, let's say, invest $10 million uh, into IPv4, um, you still need the uh, justification. So at, uh, uh, or let's say with the RPKI, we also have only the uh, root access of RPKI management instead of, you know, having a separate... Uh, um, separate uh, child allocations for PKIs, etc. Uh, but actually, RIPE is doing the best job from uh, out of the entire ecosystem, and actually, they are delivering a very good thing in terms of a technological approach, the way how their API works, because we directly utilize uh, uh, any APIs that are available in registries, and. Um, Mm, you know, again, coming back to IPv6, um, you know, the concerns about uh, who is accuracy um, is really applicable to IPv6 because even, you know, FBI asked Iron, guys, what you're going to do with uh, who is accuracy for IPv6? So um, it was, um, it, it, it's a tough topic, uh, and I think that, you know, us together, we should address all those bits and pieces and uh, work towards the, you know, uh, technological approaches uh, that we could address uh, much better uh, data uh, and, and valuable data to, to the IP addresses. Now, um, if we will look at the obstacles uh, comparing IPv4 and IPv6, uh, so, um, you know, they have a, um, it's kind of, you know, the similar protocols, but they have a completely different um, um, obstacle. So um, we identify the market and the management uh, obstacles. Uh, but uh, from the IPv4 perspectives, it costs a lot. But at the same time, you know, the, um, there are a lot of management tools available out there uh, that you can use and manage your IPv4 addresses. While the IPv6 is the opposite, you know. It, it costs nothing, but there are no management tools available uh, for it. And, um, of course, uh, another thing is that um, you have um, an interesting... Um, uh, an interesting case where um, a lot of, uh, as we see, um, network uh, admins even do not want to be familiar uh, with the IPv6 management. Um, now, there's a joke on my slide. <laughs> about IPv6. But um, three things that actually um, stops IPv6 adoption um, are the financial incentives, then you have the management, lack of management tools, and of course the know-how of IPv6, right? And what we actually see from what, um, what we have today is that IPv4 is here to stay, and IPv6 will gonna be like a parallel resource to help to help IPv4, uh, and uh, it's not gonna go away for many years. That's what we see. Uh, but you know, there are many opportunities that we as a community can do, and uh, I definitely happy to chat with you guys, um, you know, 
Uh, otherwise, I'm, uh, I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Hey. Uh, thank you for a very engaging and interesting presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of questions. At what point, um, when looking for management tools, does one say, oh no, IPv6 is not supported, darn, I won't, I won't use it? I think it's perhaps much more likely, and to be fair, I've never come across this issue so far in my, my professional capacity where there wasn't IPv6 capabilities available in the management tools that I've been using. But I would have thought at this point, certainly, certainly with the amount of software that's available, we would simply say, it doesn't support IPv6, I'm not going to buy it, surely. There's, there's plenty of software available, surely. Absolutely, there are plenty of them. But you know, when you drill deeper, you will find a lot of limitations in terms of IPv6. And, by the way, you know, if we will dig deeper inside of the networks, right, for management of IPv6, let's say DHCP, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. yes, you will find some. But when you actually talk, uh, you know, outside of the networks where it's related to the actual registries and, you know, unification of the actual policies, there are no tools available at all. Yeah, I think we could debate that one. Um, the other question I was keen on finding an answer for was uh, on one of the earlier slides you had a, a number of IP addresses that weren't announced to the internet. Yeah. How did you come up with that number? So we actually scanned the whole BGP table and we then compiled all the data. Because 1.2 trillion is a lot. I know the US DOD is sat on, was it eight or nine slash eights? And that's about 130 odd, 140 odd million. Addresses. Yeah, I think, you know, since the data is public, we can send you an Excel spreadsheet. Mm. I'm wondering if you're including the Class D and Class E space as well in that list. Uh, that all list. of the space. Yeah, because, I mean, they're not available. We can't use them. Sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Any other Thank question you. in the room? Yeah. Well, not in the room. Dave, any other question? Uh, yes. I have got one from Leo Vagoda, who has asked, uh, can you expand on the specific issue or issues reported to you on registration data accuracy for IPv6 as opposed to IPv4? So, you know, if we talk about the who is accuracy, uh, that's uh, the thing where uh, we kind of, uh, you know, been exploring uh, those bits and pieces ourselves and uh, to maintain, just to kind of, you know, give, give some brief information, to maintain the who is on, on IPv6 is definitely not the same thing as maintain who is accuracy for IPv4. Um, because of the amount of IP addresses, right? Now, the conversation that I actually had and when we uh, kind of uh, try to uh, try to explore ourselves on, let's say, building uh, the stack for IPv6, that was uh, Mm, a problem with the actual database, you know, and how big it should be to maintain, you know, that much of IP addresses. I mean, IPv6 addresses, right? So that was the concern. Okay, last shout out. Any other questions? Someone? No? Then thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.